Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing linear independence. Okay, so in the previous video what we saw was the actual definition of a linearly independent set of vectors within a vector space capital V. Okay, so a linearly independent set which we'll call capital L is a set of vectors for which the only linear combination of those vectors which actually gives us its answer, the zero vector, is the linear combination where all of the scalars are equal to zero in the field. Okay, the additive identity of the field. That's the only way that you can take a linear combination of the vectors in this set and get the zero vector as your answer. And we saw that if that definition is satisfied, it has a very beautiful consequence, which is that all the different linear combinations of this set of vectors give us their answer, distinct vectors in the vector space. Okay, so no two distinct linear combinations of this set of n vectors will have as their answer the same vector in the vector space, if this condition is true. Okay, and what we did is we proved that by supposing the opposite was true, supposing that we did have two distinct linear combinations which were different from one another, but were, which gave us their answer, the same vector in the vector space, then what we could do is it disproved this condition being true. We could find another linear combination other than the trivial one uh, which gave the zero vector. Okay, what we now want to do is get a bit more intuition for what it means for a set of vectors to be linearly independent by having a look at what is true in a set that it isn't linearly independent, which is not going to be true in a set which is linearly independent. Okay, so what then we're going to do is we're going to take a set of vectors which we'll now call capital S again. Okay, and once again we'll notate this as V1, V2, all the way up to Vn, and we're going to assume that this now isn't linearly independent. Okay, and a set of vectors that isn't linearly independent will be called linearly dependent. Okay, so we've got a linearly dependent set of vectors. Now what does that mean? Well that means that it doesn't obey that criterion. It doesn't obey the criterion that the only linear combination of this set of vectors that equals the zero vector is equal to the trivial combination. So what that means is that there must be some other linear combination of this set of linearly dependent vectors which gives the zero vector. So let's write that out. Okay, so we'll have C1, V1, plus C2, V2, plus all the way up to Cn, Vn. And for some uh, non-trivial combination of Ci, so for some combination where they're not all equal to zero, this must give us the answer, the zero vector. Okay, so I'll stress again, but not all of these are zero this time, okay, if this set is not going to be linearly independent. So this must exist if this set is not going to obey the criterion for linear independence. Okay, now, what this actually allows us to do is write one of the vectors in this set of vectors as a linear combination of the rest, okay? And the reason for this is that if this linear combination of the vectors here, uh, V1 all the way up to Vn, is not the trivial linear combination, then not all of these are equal to zero, so at least one of them must not be equal to zero. Let's say, uh, just for the sake of argument, that it's this one here. Let's say Cn is not equal to zero. Okay, what I'm now going to show you is that we can write this other vector, sorry, this vector Vn here, okay, which has as its coefficient Cn, we can write that vector as a linear combination of the remaining vectors, V1, V2, all the way up to Vn minus 1. And then what we will do is show that if a set of vectors is linearly independent, then it is not possible to write one of the vectors as a linear combination of the other vectors. Okay? Right, so let's do this now. So firstly, let's try and prove that now we can write Vn as a linear combination of all the other vectors here. Okay, so what we're firstly going to start by doing then is by adding the additive inverses for all the rest on here, basically. And we'll be able to do this no matter what the coefficient here is. Okay, all of these things that we've got, C1, V1, C2, V2, all the way up to Cn minus 1, Vn minus 1, they are all just vectors. 
all vectors have an additive inverse in the vector space. So we can add on that additive inverse to both sides of this equation. It will remove them from this side. And what we'll end up with is Cn Vn is equal to the additive inverse of C1 V1 plus the additive inverse of C2 V2 plus all the way up to the additive inverse of Cn minus 1 Vn minus 1. And from a theorem that we've already discussed, okay, the additive inverse of C times V is equal to the additive inverse of the scalar C times V. Okay, so what can happen now is that we can swallow these additive inverse symbols into the scalar, basically. Okay, so I'll put brackets now around all these scalars, like so. Okay, so this is going rather well. All we now need to do is get rid of this Cn here. Now, how can we do that? Well, what we can do is scalar multiply both sides by the multiplicative inverse of Cn. Now, remember, Cn, by assumption, was not equal to zero. It was not the additive identity within the field. Now, what do we know about fields? All elements other than the additive identity within the field have a multiplicative inverse in the field. Okay, so Cn here will have a multiplicative inverse, which I will notate 1 over Cn. So what I'm now going to do is multiply both sides here of the equation, scalar multiply both sides of the equation by 1 over Cn. Okay, and that's perfectly valid. If this is equal to this, these two vectors are equal to one another, then I can scalar multiply them both by this, and I'll still get the same. Uh, well, the equation will still be true. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have 1 over Cn times Cn uh, times Vn here. Okay, and then on the other side, what I'll end up with is 1 over Cn times this great big mess over here. The additive inverse of C1 times V1 plus the additive inverse of C2 times V2 plus all the way along to the additive inverse of Cn minus 1 times Vn minus 1. Okay, so let's just colour this all in. Okay, so here is this thing here. We've now got our scalar multiple that we've just put in here. Okay, and here is this thing here. Now, of course, what we can do is we'll firstly look at this side and then we'll look at this side. What we can do is we can say, okay, let's apply associativity of scalar multiplication here. So this side is obviously just equal to 1 over Cn times Cn in the field scalar multiplied by Vn. So we're just applying associativity of scalar multiplication, which says that if we have one thing multiplied by uh, or a, a vector that's already been scalar multiplied by another thing, then what we can do is firstly multiply these two scalars together in the field, as we're doing here, and then take the answer and scalar multiply that by a vector Vn. Okay, so I've just changed where the bracket is, basically. But I've done more than that because I've changed um, scalar multiplication into field multiplication here. Now, by definition, 1 over Cn was the multiplicative inverse of Cn in the field. So by definition, they multiply together in the field to give the multiplicative identity in the field. Okay, so they give 1, and 1 scalar multiplies by any vector to give that vector back again. So this side, then, is just Vn. Okay, so now we've turned this side into Vn, and we've got that Vn is equal to this mess here. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to apply distributivity. Okay, we're going to uh, process this side a little bit more. We're going to try and uh, remove, well, we're going to try and turn this thing into um, this thing multiplied by each of these in turn. Okay, now we did this in the previous video when we uh, studied linear combinations and span, but I'll just remind you of the argument for why distributivity holds over so many vectors added together here, okay? So, one of the axioms then that scalar multiplication must obey is that if you have some scalar from the field multiplying two vectors v plus v bar which are added together, that that is equal to c times v plus c times v bar. And this basically says that it doesn't matter whether you firstly add the two vectors together and then scalar multiply them by the elements of the field, or whether you first scalar multiply them by the elements of the field and then add them together. Again, this is one of the axioms that we insist scalar multiplication must obey. Okay, now we have got a bigger version of that here. We have got some scalar 
from the field multiplied by loads of vectors added together. So we have more than two vectors here. Here's one vector, here's another vector, and it goes on all the way up to the n minus one vector. Okay, but as soon as you insist that this is true, you can extend it to an arbitrary number like this. Okay, and the reason is that you can break this up. Okay, you can say, okay, let's make this into just the addition of two vectors. Let's say this is one vector here, this negative c1 times v1. Let's treat this as one vector, and then let's treat all the rest of this as one vector as well. And then we can just apply this formula. We can say that this is equal to 1 over cn times negative c1 v1, okay, like so, plus, and then what we'll get is 1 over cn times the rest of it, the rest of it which we viewed as just being one vector. So all the rest needs to be here, negative c2 v2 plus all the way up to negative cn minus 1 times vn minus 1, like so. Okay, but then what we can do is apply the same trick again. We can say, view this as being one vector, and then view all the rest, the negative c3 times v3 plus negative c4 times v4 plus all the way up to negative cn minus 1 vn minus 1 as being one vector as well. And then we can split it up as well into 1 over cn times negative c2 v2 and then plus 1 times c over n uh, times all the rest of it and this continues on until eventually you can break it up in fully uh, down into plus 1 over c to the power sorry cn here times and how am I going to fit this in negative cn minus 1 times vn minus 1 there Okay, so indeed, distributivity, as soon as you insist that this is true, it works for an arbitrary number of vectors here. You can just split it up. Okay, um, scalar multiplication distributes over addition of an arbitrary number of vectors. Okay, right. Uh, so now what we're going to do is apply associativity of scalar multiplication again. So we'll, we'll take it from being a vector scalar multiplied by one thing and then scalar multiplied by another thing to just scalar multiply these two scalars sorry, not scalar multiply, multiply the two scalars together in the field, and then scalar multiply the answer by the vector. So what then will the right-hand side of this equation overall become? It'll become 1 over Cn, okay, the multiplicative inverse of Cn, and I'll just move this up a little bit, uh, times um, negative C1, so the additive inverse of C1, and then scalar multiply that answer by v1. So this is multiplication in the field. Okay, so you're multiplying these two things together in the field, getting an answer within the field, and then scalar multiplying that by v1. Okay, and you can continue this on. So we'll reassociate this. So we'll have the multiplicative inverse of cn uh, multiplied in the field by the additive inverse of c2, and then scalar multiplied by v2, like so. Okay. And then this goes on all the way up till we have um, the multiplicative inverse of Cn multiplied in the field by the additive inverse of Cn minus 1, and then times the vector Vn minus 1, and that's again scalar multiplication. Okay, so we have set out to do what, well, we have done what we set out to do here. We have this vector Vn written as a linear combination of the other n minus 1 vectors in that set, because all these elements here are elements of the field, okay? Uh, we're just taking the multiplicative inverse of one element of the field and multiplying it by the additive inverse of another element of the field, and that will just give us another element of the field. So all of these coefficients are just elements of the field. So what I have succeeded in doing effectively is saying that Vn is actually an element of the span of the set containing all the other vectors in that set S. So the span of the set V1, V2, all the way up to Vn minus 1. Okay, and that's a key property of linearly dependent sets of vectors, that one or more of the vectors can be written as a linear combination of all of the other vectors, okay, in that set, okay, and this is not going to be true if the set of vectors is linearly independent, so that's what I now want to show you. This is true if the set of vectors is linearly dependent, that you can always write one of the vectors as a linear combination of the other vectors in the set. What I now want to show you is that this is not true if it's linear 
linearly independent. You cannot write one of the vectors as a linear combination of the other vectors if the set is linearly independent. So let's take a set of vectors that is linearly independent. So here is L, our set of vectors which is going to be linearly independent. V1, V2, all the way up to Vn. Okay, And what I want to show now is that you cannot, absolutely cannot, um, write one of the vectors in this set as a linear combination of the other vectors if this set is linearly independent. So I'll just reiterate what it means for this set to be linearly independent. Remember, it means that the only linear combination of uh, these vectors which will give the zero vector is that trivial linear combination where all of the scalars are zero. Okay. Right, so what we're now going to do to prove then that you can't write one of these vectors as a linear combination of the others, we will do it by a proof by contradiction. We'll assume you can, and then we'll disprove that this set is linearly independent. Okay, right, so let's say that we can write Vn as a linear combination of the others. Okay, so Vn, let's say, is equal to some linear combination which will have C1, V1, plus C2, V2, plus all the way up to Cn minus 1, Vn minus 1. Okay, so we're just saying, okay, we're assuming the exact opposite of what we want to prove. Let Vn be a linear combination of the other vectors in this set. Okay, now what I need to do is prove that there then is a non-trivial linear combination of the entire set of vectors which gives the zero vector. Well, this is extremely easy. All I need to do is take this over onto the other side. Okay, so what I'm going to do is add onto both sides the additive inverse of Vn. Okay, on this side I'll get the zero vector, because when I add on the additive inverse of this vector Vn, uh, we will just get them cancelling and giving the zero vector. On the other side, what I'll now end up with is C1 V1 plus C2 V2 plus all the way up to Cn minus 1, Vn minus 1, and then what we'll have is plus the additive inverse of Vn. Okay, now um, the additive inverse of Vn is the same as negative 1 in the field times the vector Vn. Okay, because you can always view Vn as equaling 1 times Vn. Okay, so if you like, you can view the additive inverse of Vn here be, as being the additive inverse of 1 times Vn, and then you can just apply this theorem that we had here to say that that's going to then be negative 1 times V. Okay, so this is just a special case of what we saw earlier uh, by sticking that 1 in front of Vn. Okay, so what I can then say is that this then, okay, and I'll just write one final line then in this proof. Okay, so the zero vector then is equal to C1 times V1 plus C2 times V2 plus all the way up to Cn minus 1 times Vn minus 1 plus negative 1, which is an element of the field, the additive inverse of the multiplicative identity in the field, at times this vector Vn. Okay, so there you have it, a non-trivial linear combination of these vectors, V1, V2, all the way up to Vn, which gives the zero vector in the vector space. Okay, and that therefore disproves uh, the uh, set of vectors being linearly independent. Okay, because by definition, if this set of vectors is linearly independent, there can be no other linear combination other than that trivial linear combination, uh, which gives the zero vector. Okay, right. Uh, so that's the end of the theory regarding linear independence. What I want to do in the next video is move on to examples of sets that are linearly independent and examples of sets that are not linearly independent. Firstly, we'll do it in any vector space. Well, we'll do it in an abstract vector space, so for a general vector space, and then we'll go specific. We'll go to our old and favourite example, R3.